this is a video resume. It'll take me, I'll try to get the whole life in, but uh, I may get caught up in some fragments. Let's look at the major periods. There's this math science period from elementary school on the, through high school. In elementary school, it was a reading. My, my father gave me $100 a month for a book budget, so I bought my own books from like fourth, third grade in elementary school all the way through 18. And uh, everybody else was proud of what they had. I was proud of the library I was building. Of course, for the first few years, I didn't read any of those books. But then it got embarrassing to show people my great library, and they would pick up a book and see the pages were unbent, and I obviously hadn't read any of them. And So eventually, out of shame, I started actually reading them. And I, it turned out to be fun to read them, so I read a lot of them. And I ended up with a huge reading habit because of that idea of my father of a $100 a month book budget. At the time, that was a lot of money for a kid to spend each month. Uh, it could be spent only on books, and there was no obligation to read the books this year or next year. When my mother complained I wasn't reading them, my father just uh, very crudely told her to shut up, leave the kid alone. He'll read them when he feels like it. It's enough that he looks at them and plays around with them once in a while until he's ready to read them. That's fine. And he was right. That worked. That worked. Number two, uh, in high school, I did three summer jobs uh, doing computer programs, uh, a star mapper in APL for uh, an uh, amateur astronomy club that used these Navy-built uh, telescopes on the Appalachian Mountains for uh, stargazing uh, that would automatically compare uh, photographs of the night sky for changes. I uh, wrote that in APL. APL is a great language for that kind of parallel stuff. And then I did a Fortran 1 program on an IBM 701 that had an eight-digit limit to the size of numbers it would do. I did a Bino Taylor series, binomial, pardon me, binomial series expansion of the stress integrals of bridge design, multiplied them all out, keeping integer coefficients, which meant I had to use arrays of eight, eight columns per array, row uh, to multiply the big numbers, and kept integer coefficients because when you do that, you get very simple looking patterns of numbers in your coefficients that are very, very accurate. And so our final resulting series was very, very accurate and had this beautiful pattern of numbers in the numerators and denominators. That was my second program. And the third one was a LISP 1.5 program provided for me by the Virginia Institute for Scientific Research across the street from my house. A nice old man there who gave me the tape for that, told me to learn it and then use it to control a crystal growing machine he had that, for growing half meter long crystals. So I did that at three summer programming jobs. So in the beginning, I taught myself calculus, uh, analysis of real numbers, simple topology, up to and including house door spaces. Uh, number theory, and a bunch of mathematical things uh, just by reading books of, that I found on the floor of my father's closet that he had ordered but not read because he had intended to go to night school and didn't finish. And uh, I was stuck for a while on sin, cos, and tan. I couldn't do the calculus because I didn't know what they were. And after a year of waiting, a student finally told me, like third grade of elementary school, that that's trigonometry. <laughs> I bought the book that day from a library, brought it home, read it, did all the homework that night, and the next two weeks I spent every minute of the day and night doing calculus book homework because I suddenly knew what sin, cos, and tan were, and finished about six, eight calculus books, and uh, then got into analysis of real numbers and uh, number theory. had trouble with that because it was so totally different. It was real math and not fake engineer type math. And uh, then again, another high school student's father uh, gave me a key book on that by Lillian Lieber on Cantor set theory, and then that enabled me to suddenly understand number theory and the real math analysis of real numbers and topology. And uh, so I read about, I don't know, 20, 30 books on that very sincerely on my own, and I actually developed this idea that schools were flawed and faulty, teachers were underpaid, and local schools were extremely bigoted, gender-wise, politically, racist-wise, and I had grown up in a very benighted part of the world. My parents were ignorant, My uh, the peers and students around me were ignorant, my Government was ugly and selfish, slave owning leftover and all that. And at uh, college uh, at 18 is where I would escape all the bigotry in my local school system. And I was, I, I don't know, somehow I got the idea that I'm supposed to do two thirds of my learning every day on books outside of schools, much, much better than what any public school would use. And then be gentle to the teachers and try to get value out of what's in public school because they're doing the best they can from their local bigoted point of view. And they're not going to work very hard and try very hard, no matter how much I complain. So just try to get value from them. Don't bitch about them and, and try be nice and let them go about their business. But be aware that two-thirds of the value of each day has got to be done on my own outside of schools because I'm not going to get anything but out-of-date bigoted crap from them. And boy, in Virginia, that was true. And then uh, in high school, I got these summer jobs. Uh, my first summer job, though, my fourth one, my first one out of four, was horrible and a slave-owning thing where they told you when you could go to the bathroom and not. 
and what kind of going to the bathroom you could do. I mean, it's amazing. It was like white slaves uh, in Virginia just took the habits of black slaves and the transferred them to white people as employees as slaves. And I real and I got books on that. So somebody gave me one of my teachers gave me uh, Bacon's Panopticon about this uh, watchtower in the center of cubicles without walls and a cylinder. So that even when nobody was in the watchtower, because it had one-way mirrors, you couldn't see, and you felt watched even when there was nobody watching you. And this is an ideal factory design for 1650 or 1700. The European uh, upper class were so ugly to most of the people in their society. I realized that the world had undergone a 400-year struggle against that, and they had not solved it at all. We still have Harvard creating wars all over the war world, stealing money in Wall Street. We still have psychopaths running the country. And so we, we've not really solved that problem at all. We've mitigated it a little bit. But we still have elite, psychopath elites out of hand, so, uh, using the country for their own personal enrichment in a very psychopathic way, just like they became president of their high school class by manipulating other people in a psychopathic way. That's our elites. And, you know, Halberston in The Best and the Brightest wrote it all up for Vietnam, but a, a heck of a lot of other people have been killed. And now our own societies are being destroyed, all their wealth taken away by those same Harvard-trained elites. So, you know, that's a thousand-year journey. We're at year 400. We got 600 more years of work to do on that front. However, uh, I got to MIT. It was heaven. Man, that was cool. I mean, everybody was sincere. Everybody worked hard. Nobody beat you up. Uh, people read books. I mean, people read books voluntarily. People read their own books, not school books. It was terrific. Uh, I really had a ball. And then, uh, But I realized the cultural place is overly male. They celebrated suicides of students. Uh, that the MIT faculty uh, largely were cowards hiding behind math because they couldn't think. And I went to Wellesley for creative writing to sort of get out of the neurotic weakness of MIT overly male culture. And that really worked. The man, the courses at Wellesley were harder than MIT courses by far mentally. And that challenged me. I wanted mental tough stuff. That was fun. And so I had Robert Pinsky in Modern English Poetry. I had W.H. Alden visiting at Wellesley and Harvard for Modern Poetry. I had uh, Ray Bradbury for science fiction, and I had this socialist monster, Lillian Hellman, for novel drama, and she was useful. I mean, she was really a bad person. I, there's no other word for it, just a bad, selfish human being, uh, full of herself, uh, not nice to students, not nice to people, uh, talented, and she made a career out of nastiness, and it was really fun to compare that with Bradbury, who was the nicest person the world has ever known, and uh, one of them wouldn't fly airplanes, so <laughs> just... And then W.H. Auden, which like brought 10,000 years of Western civilization into the room every time he opened his mouth. It was just awesome. I was just, and I was so grateful for MIT and Wellesley. I did, uh, you know, was, uh, Taoist living and Buddhist two hours a day of practice for a year and a half. My last two years at MIT with Gary Snyder and uh, Nathan Sivan and Houston Smith and Daisetsu Suzuki just before he died. Um, so I was very seriously into Zazen and got what they call enlightenment of several sorts from doing that, and I, I've written that up in a couple of my books. Uh, but that was very, very, uh, that was what got me over anxiety my entire life. Uh, that's been an extraordinary, powerful tool uh, for grounding me. Uh, boy, I recommend that as a required course for everybody in freshman year. Uh, not a course, a required year in freshman year. Um, uh, then what happened? Then uh, uh, I graduated from MIT and I said, okay, I need to pay the world back. I was feeling gratitude, real gratitude for life. So I said, okay, I work without pay for six years at an NGO. And the best NGO, the weirdest NGO, the most intellectually demanding NGO I could find, called Houston Smith on the phone asking, <laughs> say, who do you know is trying to rebuild Western civilization, eliminate all of its flaws that created things like Harvard and the Vietnam War? And he had a phone number in Framingham. <laughs> I mean, the guy, he said, okay, I'll give you the phone number of that kind of group. And sure enough, he had a group with that as its mission statement in writing. I mean, they'd written it down. And uh, they were cool. They had all this religious crap that didn't work. But they had a lot of or, or modern business methods that they had fused from different kinds of businesses. And then they applied them to humane goals. And they said, you know, the good people of the world ought to be as methodologically rigorous and disciplined as the bad people of the world and the selfish people in the world. And I thought, gee, that makes sense. And so I just sort of ignored the religious crap, which, uh, you know, <laughs> building your life around with some books that 2,000 years ago. They were better than that because they used Sartre's existential theology and Boltman Bonhoeffer's existential theology to reinterpret your relation to symbols. So they were slightly better, but basically Christianity fixes problems in Roman culture, and you can't get around that. And unless you're a Roman 2,000 years ago, Christianity is not going to do much for you except make you a better Roman and um, tell you to free your slaves and then uh, stop killing strangers in the Colosseum. Um, so what happened? Then after that, I did the six years of NGO work. 
uh, participatory policy meetings all over Asia and America. It uh, used it to get me to Japan. And then I did six years in Japan to escape the weaknesses of being American. And uh, at first I did participatory policy meetings all over Japan and tripled income in Korea's poorest villages and launched 16 venture businesses in Hokkaido with a 10-day 800-person consult uh, and all that stuff. And then I uh, learned quality at Sekisu Chemical and Matsushita Electric after I built my own network in Japan through the leading doctors of Japan who are still my friends today. And they introduced me to Sekisu management and Matsushita management, so I got to see Deming Prize stuff. And then uh, I went back to the University of Michigan with my new Japanese wife for graduate school at the University of Michigan, which was number one in anthropology, political science, sociology, and psychology when I was there. Wow, that's harder stuff than either the arts at Wellesley or than engineering at MIT. And the calculus is the arithmetic that stupid engineers call math. And so, wow, that was, I mean, MIT I thought was hard, but actually Wellesley was harder. And I Wellesley was hard, but actually University of Michigan social science research was a lot harder. And then somebody just said at Michigan, let's found the Santa Fe Institute. I was in Jonidas's uh, social psych seminar and Holland's uh, uh, genetic algorithm seminar, and both of them went down to uh, create the Santa Fe Institute. And I met Nobel Prize winners and all the initial workshops, and Citibank gave money, and Brian Arthur did his decreasing returns to scale and increasing returns to scale stuff, network economics models of the internet, and that was a really fecund place to get into systems theory in the from the point of view of calculus, which is not really math, but the best that some professors can do, and. Um, so I, uh, I'll stop there.